Hey everyone, it's Mr. Drake. We're going to continue our look at the presidency and the bureaucracy by talking about what the president actually does in his day-to-day -day job heading up the United States government. In this video, we're going to talk about several of the roles the president has, and by the time this video is over, you should be able to name and describe each of those roles. Uh, with each role, we'll also talk about some examples of the actions that presidents can take in his uh, role as, say, for example, commander-in-chief or chief executive. And you should be able to identify and briefly explain what some of those actions are that the president can potentially take. So, with that, let's go ahead and get started with chief of state. Unlike in a lot of other countries, uh, in the United States, the president acts as the head of state and the head of government. Uh, this stands in contrast to, for example, the United Kingdom, where the head of government is the prime minister, but the head of state or sovereign is uh, the monarch, uh, presently Queen Elizabeth II. But in the United States, the president sort of uh, fulfills both of those roles. And in that role as chief of state, the president is the symbol of the nation. Um, he serves as that symbol both here in the United States and uh, in foreign countries. Um, to that end, he will be president at major events in the United States, um, maybe commemorating war heroes, uh, or as you see here in this picture, you know, throwing out the ceremonial first pitch to start the baseball season, um, which is a tradition that goes back um, over a hundred years now. Um, the president can also serve as America's representative abroad. Um, this could be by going to the funeral of a foreign leader, for example. Now, of course, the president has a lot on his plate. So, in many cases, the role of chief of state uh, may have to be delegated. Uh, the vice president will often go to funerals of foreign leaders, for example, or the first lady will represent the president at um, events here at home or maybe even abroad. So, um, plenty to do, but again, the president, uh, even if he's not there uh, you know, in the flesh, is considered America's um, symbol, as it were. You could say that the president's primary day-to-day -day job is heading up the executive branch of the government. That is the branch of the government responsible for enforcing the laws that are passed by Congress. Uh, in his role as chief executive, the president appoints uh, members of the cabinet. That's uh, things like Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Attorney General, Secretary of Education. Uh, we'll be talking more about those as this unit progresses if you're one of my students. But he appoints them with Senate approval, and he also appoints other federal department heads and uh, some 2,000 or so um, other federal jobs. But again, most of those uh, posts have to be approved by the Senate before they can actually take um, office. He can issue executive orders. Executive orders are things the president can tell uh, parts of the executive branch to do. Um, it has to be something the executive, uh, executive branch has the constitutional authority to carry out. So the president can issue an executive order levying a tax because it's Congress that has the power to tax and not the president. But the president can issue executive orders if the executive branch already has that power. And as this uh, unit goes on, we'll talk more about what those types of things are. Um, the president can also grant pardons to convicted criminals. That is... a uh, basically vacating their guilty uh, verdict and, and absolving them of all blame uh, for a crime they may have committed. Um, they can also commute people's sentences. Uh, so if someone was sentenced to death, their sentence could be reduced to life in prison or their prison sentence could be commuted or uh, taken out altogether. The most famous example of a presidential pardon is that of uh, Richard Nixon, which was given by Gerald Ford in 1974 after the Watergate scandal. Gerald Ford's rationale was that the country had suffered enough uh, as a result of Watergate, and Richard Nixon had suffered enough, and so ha putting Nixon through a trial uh, would have been a national spectacle that would have ended up really being counterproductive, so that Nixon got pardoned for any crimes he may have committed uh, as a result 
of the Watergate scandal. Um, this angered a lot of people, and it probably cost Ford re-election in 1976, but um, Ford's uh, argument always was <clears throat> that in order to um, accept a pardon, you are essentially admitting guilt. And so Nixon was admitting guilt by taking the pardon. So, you know, he did at least uh, acknowledge he had done something wrong. Most pardons are given by presidents in the last few days of their uh, term as president. Um, sometimes for historically, you know, uh, notorious court cases or or crimes uh, that, you know, there's now evidence the person didn't actually do it, they'll get pardons, for example. But these are some of the things the president does as the chief executive, and as I said, we'll be talking a lot more about this as the unit goes on. Despite there not being a military service or experience requirement to hold the office of president, the president is, as a civilian, the head of all U.S. armed forces, and that's called being the commander-in-chief. In that role, the president can deploy troops, uh, both at home and abroad, and doesn't need congressional approval to do it. Uh, we've talked in this class before about Congress being the branch of government that has the authority to declare war, but the president, as commander-in-chief, can deploy troops without an official declaration of war. Now, this power was limited uh, at the tail end of the Vietnam War by an act of Congress in 1973 called the War Powers Act, which says that the president has to inform Congress within 48 hours of deploying troops and within a set period of time must withdraw those troops if he's not given authority to keep them uh, at a particular post without congressional approval. Uh, the president has final authority over all military operations, any airstrikes of foreign countries, any invasion of a foreign country uh, does not happen without the president's say-so, and the president must give the approval um, in the unfortunate event that we ever have to deploy nuclear weapons. Uh, someone uh, stays near the president at all time with a briefcase-looking contraption called the football, um, and within the football, there is a, a, a mechanism where the president enters a code that will then launch those nuclear weapons. And those codes are a matter of uh, very, very strict confidentiality and, and national security. So that is what the president does to lead the military. The president has a very big hand in foreign policy and along with his foreign policy advisors on his staff and in the cabinet sets America's foreign policy. And in that role, the president can negotiate treaties with foreign countries, but remember that treaties have to be approved by the Senate. The president can use something called an executive agreement to make deals with other foreign leaders. And executive agreements don't have to be approved by the Senate, but they're not binding on future presidents. So if Obama made an executive agreement uh, with a foreign leader today, um, come 2017, his successor doesn't necessarily have to honor that agreement. The president appoints ambassadors to foreign countries. Um, Every country America has diplomatic relations with, well over a hundred in the world, uh, has an ambassador from the United States that sort of carries America's foreign policy message to um, those points abroad. Um, ambassadorships are usually given as political rewards. Um, a thank you for support in the last election, you know, help uh, just to give a, a cushy job to a friend, really. Um, ambassadors do have to be approved. Uh, by Congress, though. Um, the president can also recognize foreign governments as legitimate if a country has declared independence from a colonial power, for example. Uh, the United States can make the decision to recognize that new government and send them an ambassador. But America's foreign policy, again, uh, set by the president. The final formal role of the president we'll talk about here is that of chief legislator. But Mr. Drake, the president's not in the legislative branch, he's in the executive branch. I know, but he has a very close relationship with Congress and they have to interact quite a bit. Um, when the president comes into office, he obviously has an agenda. He has uh, ideas on types of laws that he wants to get passed, and he has to work with Congress to try to get those laws enacted. Because again, remember, the president can't introduce bills into Congress. He can uh, suggest bills, but then a member of Congress has to actually sponsor that 
bill. Um, the president's agenda is delivered yearly through a State of the Union address, and the Constitution requires the State of the Union address uh, to be given, quote, from time to time, end quote, um, to, to Congress. Now, until the early 20th century, the State of the Union address was something that was actually written out and just given um, to Congress for them to read. Uh, and then, starting with Woodrow Wilson, about 100 years ago, the State of the Union began to be delivered in person and has sort of become a yearly tradition in January or February uh, when the president prepares uh, to submit the budget for the next year. Um, the president can also veto bills. Uh, passed by Congress that he does not necessarily agree with uh, and can send them back to Congress to be discussed. That's one of the checks and balances we've talked about. Um, and as I mentioned just a moment ago, the president also delivers the yearly budget, or proposes, I should say, the yearly budget for the federal government. Of course, it is uh, amended and changed and negotiated and hammered out by Congress before it actually becomes approved. The last role we'll talk about for the president really isn't an official role that he has, but unofficially, the president is the head of whatever political party he belongs to. He's the most well-known and most influential uh, member of that party. Um, so in that role, the president can appoint his party's national chairman and has a big hand in, in setting up how uh, the party is going to proceed in future elections and what they're going to focus on, what their platform is going to be. And he can also campaign on behalf of other politicians in his party to try to help uh, get them elected. Um, the picture you see there is President Obama in the fall of 2013 campaigning for Terry McAuliffe who was running for governor of Virginia, and he actually was uh, victorious. Um, now, you may see less of this if the president is unpopular. Um, you will not see the president campaigning for Democrats in heavily red states, uh, usually, because it will turn people off to that uh, candidate, possibly. Um, if the president is just unpopular nationally, uh, you may not even see... Uh, politicians in friendly states lining up to, to get their picture taken with the president. Um, in the last couple of years of George Bush's presidency, he was really considered toxic uh, by the Republican Party, so much so that he did not even attend the Republican National Convention in 2008. But if the president is popular and has some clout with the American people, um, he may be able to go a long way toward getting um, candidates that he favors elected to office. That will do it for today. Be sure to reference this video as we go forward if you're one of my students. And as always, feel free to ask if you have any questions. Cheers.